come up and give us words of exhortation. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, John. Good morning. Uh, who here has seen the musical Hamilton? It's not bad. It's not bad. Okay, that's all right. I just want a few people to know what I'm on about. Um, if, look, if you haven't seen it, Hamilton is a Broadway musical about the life of Alexander Hamilton. It's very hard to say that name without wanting to burst into song. Uh, he's one of the founding fathers of the United States and he lived a tumultuous life before dying quite young in a pistol duel with fellow politician and frenemy Aaron Burr. One of the themes of the story is legacy, how we are remembered by others, especially after our death. The central thesis is that the way other people view us is something we can't control. And in the story, this is most evident in Aaron Burr. Burr was a real person. He was complex. He did some bad things. He did some good things. He actually rose to be the American vice president at one point. But in spite of some impressive achievements, he went down in history simply as the man who shot Hamilton. If someone were to describe Burr in one sentence, that would be it. The man who foolishly challenged Hamilton to a duel and killed him. Burr's whole life, in all its nuance, was reduced to that one sentence in the history books. In the musical, Burr laments that he will be remembered as a villain. He didn't like receiving a one-dimensional and perhaps unfair legacy. But I noticed that he was guilty, in the fictionalised narrative of the musical anyway, of doing the same thing to someone else, his grandfather. Don't know if you ever noticed this. There's a very quick but intriguing line when he describes his grandfather as a fire and brimstone preacher. If anyone remembers that bit. And that's all he has to say on that. But there was a complicated person behind those words. So here's a fun bit of history. Aaron Burr's grandfather was Jonathan Edwards, a philosopher and theologian who lived in New England in the early 18th century. He was a Puritan preacher and also a prolific writer on religious topics, but secular topics too. He, uh, he really liked science and in fact he died at the age of only 55 because he volunteered to participate in a trial of a smallpox vaccine. It didn't work. Jonathan Edwards wrote and delivered many sermons in his lifetime. His favourite topic was God's love. Unfortunately, of his many sermons, only one became truly famous, and it was the one titled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Described as a classic of early American literature, it was all about the horrors of hell that a sinner can expect to experience if they die in their sins. That sermon may well have been the only time Edwards ever spoke on that subject. History records that he delivered it in his usual style. He was softly spoken and gentle, a man not giving to shouting. Nevertheless, his words were so impactful that those who heard them were said to have wept and wailed in terror. And thus, sinners in the hands of an angry God became his most famous sermon despite being unique among his numerous other sermons, which had titles like Heaven is a World of Love. Fast forward to Hamilton the Musical, and Aaron Burr describes his grandfather in one quick sentence as a fire and brimstone preacher. You would be forgiven for thinking that meant an angry, ranting man obsessed with hell. When really, if you do a bit of reading up on Jonathan Edwards, it's easy to discover that fire and brimstone preacher is actually quite a misrepresentation of a man who was known for being softly spoken and fond of discussing the love of God, except for that one time. And it's ironic, really, that Burr himself is later upset to receive the same treatment when his legacy is reduced to just his greatest mistake. Imagine what it must be like to leave a legacy 
based on your worst moment. And we have a name for it, disgrace, disgracing. Sadly, it does happen a lot, especially to people who were in the public eye and favoured for a time, only to fall hard. For example, what's Lance Armstrong going to be remembered for? Probably not the Livestrong Foundation. Probably not beating cancer. Probably not his legitimate prowess as a cyclist before he got into doping. No, the opening line of his legacy is going to be one of sport's greatest drug cheats. And if you read on, you'll get to the good things he did too, but that bad thing is always going to be his headline. And perhaps he deserves that, I'm not defending his cheating. I just observe that very human tendency to remember a person's sins first and foremost, before anything else, and often at the expense of everything else. And we might even enjoy it. We might get a bit of tall poppy syndrome when someone who used to be widely loved is undone by a scandal or revealed to be not nearly as wonderful as everybody thought. We might feel a little bit smug to see them get knocked off their pedestal. And in this way, we actually give a lot of power to sin. When a person's sin comes to light, public opinion may be that that person is disgraced, fallen from grace, unforgiven, and as we say often today, cancelled. Hamilton the musical explores the idea that once a person has died and everyone who knew them personally has also died, they are completely without a voice. If their legacy in history is wrong or missing some crucial context, it's too bad. The time for defence has passed. I recently finished reading the classic George Orwell novel 1984, uh, which is a terrible downer, but it is a worthwhile read. Um, one of the important themes in that book is this same idea of our inability to control our legacies. In a story of 1984, the dreaded Ministry of Truth edits records to delete people from history. And what makes it such a bone-chilling concept is that it is completely possible. Eventually, absolutely everyone becomes nothing more than a gravestone and some records. And those are things that can be changed or even destroyed. So not only do we not get a say in whether our legacies are positive, we also can't even ensure their existence in the passage of time. Now, before you think this is the most depressing talk you've ever heard, I only highlight these dark facts because it's a darkness that's overcoming Jesus Christ. So it does get better. When it comes to leaving a legacy, the people whose lives are recorded in the Bible, they have more enduring legacies than most. We can read their life stories, their moments, good and bad, and form opinions of them. And they are, of course, all very dead and unable to defend themselves if we get their legacies wrong. And I reckon we all must have misunderstood or misinterpreted them on occasion. Even with Bible characters for whom we do have a lot of their writing or writing about them, it's still, in the end, pretty scant information for building comprehensive pictures of complicated human beings. And unfortunately, when forming opinions of them, we might tend to think most often about their worst moments, the juicy headlines, the scandals, because these things are naturally interesting to us. And thus we give power and weight to their sin. An absolutely classic case study in this regard is David. If you had to reduce the life of King David to just a few sentences, you know, what would you include? What would you say? The Bible does give us such a summary at uh, 1 Kings 15 verse 5, which reads as follows. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. You know, he was that close. David had a basically unblemished record as one of the great men of God, 
until the episode with Bathsheba and Uriah. David was a hero. He was an underdog against the vicious King Saul. He overcame severe trials and was established as king over a flourishing Israel. But he ruined his record by committing one of the Bible's most notorious sins. Obsessed with Bathsheba, he arranged the murder of her husband, Uriah, so that he could marry her himself. And these great sins tainted his legacy. And I think we do give a lot of power to those sins. In reflecting on them, sometimes we can end up talking about David in disparaging ways. And of course, he was an ordinary man and he shouldn't be idolised. His sins were sins. They were wrong, indefensible. Yet, I have observed times when we in our Bible studies can almost fixate on David's sins. His sins are given such emphasis that he becomes grotesque to us, a figure of lust and scheming and violence, certainly not someone to admire. And again, I wonder if it's human nature to want to give sin power so that it overwhelms a person's legacy. Because this is the thing about sin. From early on in our journeys of faith, we know that sin is the key factor in the fallen state of humankind. It's what went wrong. It's why Adam and Eve left the garden. It's why we suffer. It's why we get hurt and hurt others and feel guilty. It's why we are naturally out of step with God and in need of his grace and forgiveness. That makes sin powerful stuff. To bring to mind a few key verses, we have, uh, for example, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is universal. The only person to ever live who never sinned was Jesus. The rest of us have all sinned and thus all fallen short of God's perfection. There's Galatians 5 verse 9 and other verses that have the same image. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. This is a picture of how even a little itty bitty sin that doesn't seem like much ruins your whole life. You can't unleaven a batch of dough once even a dash of yeast is in it. And likewise, once you are soiled by sin, you can't dust it off. You don't need much and it sticks forever. And Romans 6 verse 23, of course, the wages of sin is death. Sin is so bad that the only fit justice is death. Sin is always a hanging offence and the maximum sentence is always served. And these verses are correct. Everyone has sinned. Even a little sin is enough to ruin you and the just outcome is death. We all intrinsically understand this and sometimes treat people according to it. That was Aaron Burr's problem. He sinned when he killed Hamilton and it leavened the whole proverbial batch of dough and he never escaped it. People did not let him forget. He could not move on. After the duel, his political career never recovered. He dodged lawsuits for the rest of his life. His second wife was particularly spiteful in their divorce by hiring one of Hamilton's sons to be her divorce lawyer, trying to hit Burr where it really hurt. He fell from grace and people refused to give him grace again. It may be something we encounter in our own lives with our sins. I'm going to assume that nobody here has ever shot someone in a duel, but maybe in your past you've had your own Burr versus Hamilton moment when you did something that you or others consider so bad that you feel like you will never wash away the shame. It leavened your batch of dough. And you know the wages is death. And so you go through life with this disaster hanging over you. And this sort of tainted legacy is a reality for a lot of people who have fallen from grace and can't seem to get back to grace let alone hope that other people will be gracious to them. We, we think that sin is just too powerful. 
But if sin is powerful, God's grace is far more powerful. If we have our eyes fixed on sin, we're looking at the wrong place. Going back to David as an example, nobody condones his sins with Bathsheba and Uriah, including God. David suffered some awful consequences because of what he did. But God didn't give up on David. David's legacy was certainly tainted in the eyes of others. His sins would not be forgotten. But regardless of the opinions that people had of David, of greater importance is the opinion that God has of David, the legacy David left in heaven's eyes rather than the world's eyes. In Acts 13, 22, Paul declared that God's testimony about David is that David was, infamously, a man after God's own heart. What a powerful description that is. Rather than writing David off when he sinned, God saw David's true heart, that of a good man who was appalled when he recognised his sin. And so where human beings might be inclined to let David fall from grace, God dispensed grace all the more. He looked at the mess of David's sin and said, this this is terrible, but I can work in this. God made Bathsheba the mother of Solomon, the next king. God maintained that same royal line all the way to Christ, in spite of how disappointing so many of the kings were. Sin after sin after horrible sin meant that that line to Christ was blackened and bloody, but at every turn, God's grace was more powerful than sin. So why do we often not fully believe that or act like it's true? Why is it we can tend to give more power and emphasis to sin than to grace? It's it's why I think when we speak about people who have died and can't defend themselves anymore, we ought to be gracious with our words and assume the best of them. And this goes especially for someone like David, of whom God spoke well. If God speaks well of someone, that's good enough for me. And if God speaks well of us, should we not also treat ourselves with kindness and grace? We believe our sins are forgiven and blotted out in the sin-covering name of Jesus. And that means God speaks well of us. Would we dare say differently? To use another example, one of the kings who came after David was Ahab. And according to the record in 1 Kings 16, Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. How's that for a bad legacy? Among his many sins, Ahab worshipped and built monuments for Baal and Asherah, married the murderous Jezebel, and contended with the prophet Elijah. Many of Ahab's actions are recounted in scripture, and it's mostly a tale of relentless sinning. But then we get to the passage that Julia read from us from 1 Kings 21, where Elijah tells Ahab what his fate will be for all his wicked ways. His descendants will be completely wiped out. In fact, they will be eaten by dogs and birds. It's a very ugly prophecy against Ahab. The record says there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord and behaved in the vilest manner. But then there is a frankly shocking twist. As we read, when Ahab heard Elijah's words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, fasted, and went around meekly. This is the posture of a remorseful man, a man who realised he'd done the wrong thing and was throwing himself on God's mercy. Next thing we read, God says to Elijah, Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, 
I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I, I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. It's almost an anticlimactic ending. Ahab had been established as basically the worst king to date, irredeemable, a thoroughly deplorable villain. He had already been sentenced to a dreadful end and that would have been just. Instead, he puts on a new humble attitude and God sees this and is moved and remarks to Elijah, you know what, Elijah, I'm still going to get rid of the house of Ahab, but not yet. And this 180 degree turn in Ahab's fortunes, it's almost offensive to our innate sense of justice. Scripture spends a long time, uh, several chapters, building Ahab up as Israel's number one bad guy and then in the space of a few sentences gives him a leniency he surely doesn't deserve. God doesn't change his mind about Ahab's ultimate fate, but he does soften the blow. So how do we react to this? Contrasting Ahab with David, in David we see a man who did all the right things, except that one time he got it wrong. In Ahab we have the opposite. A man who did all the wrong things except that one time he got it right. Now it's just an observation but I feel like we easily condemn David for the bad thing he did but we never speak well of Ahab for the good thing he did. It's like we view sin as worth more than goodness. It's heavier, it's stronger, it's, more, it's a more influential force than goodness. Commit a sin once and you can spend the rest of your life doing good deeds to try to make up for it and even then some people will never forgive you. And I know in my job, which is all about writing, if I make one mistake, I'll fret over it and not give a second thought to the hundreds of other editorial decisions I made that were correct. All I can see is that one mistake that ruins the whole thing. How do we feel about God giving the wicked King Ahab some reprieve from his punishment? Maybe we're inclined to react a bit like Jonah, the prophet Jonah, who, if you'll recall, became stroppy with God because he thought God was too soft on the city of Nineveh. God had sent Jonah to the wicked city of Nineveh to warn the people that they would be overthrown because of their sin. Contrary to Jonah's expectations, the people of Nineveh believed the warning and repented. They gave up on evil and pleaded with God to spare them. And God heard them, relented and did not overthrow Nineveh. Jonah hated that. He thought it was wrong. And he said to God, to summarise his thoughts, I knew you would do this. I knew you would forgive them. This is why I didn't want to come. Why did you forgive them? They're horrible, every one of them. All they did was get a bit sad and then you couldn't go through with punishing them. And God replied, oh, Nineveh has more than 120,000 people. Should I not be concerned for them? And the book of Jonah ends on that question. You know, maybe we can at times identify with Jonah for being annoyed at God's compassion. Uh, the natural, immediate, inbuilt human response to the sight of someone doing evil is to hope they get what's coming to them. We want justice. You know, if we see someone in public who's behaving stupidly or dangerously, we probably tend to think uncharitable thoughts. Our knee-jerk response is to fixate on the bad. But God's knee-jerk response is precisely the opposite. He fixates on the good in a person, even in the face of overwhelming bad. And that's how he was with Nineveh. Jonah's response of, oh, come on, it's maybe something we can understand. 
But I tell you what, if God were not like that, we would be in some serious trouble. If God threw out the whole batch of dough, once it was leavened, and we faced what we really deserve, we would be without hope. But God operates differently. He's the only one who can unleaven bread. And at this point, it would be a terrible oversight, not to mention the key factor that all these stories have in common. There is a magic moment in all these tales where grace overcomes sin. For Ahab, it was putting on sackcloth, fasting and humbling himself. For Nineveh, it was the king's declaration that everyone needed to fast, pray urgently to God for help and stop their evil acts. The magic moment was repentance, true repentance, not lip service, not a false show, but genuine remorse demonstrated in actions. Repentance is the critical moment when a sinner realises their sin, appreciates that they're out of alignment with God and in genuine humility turns back to him. It doesn't have to be a loud or dramatic turning point. There just has to be a good heart that's feeling remorse. The reason David was a man after God's own heart was not that he always got everything right. It was that when he realised he had done something wrong, he was immediately regretful and tried to fix it. That's what a good heart does. It's not necessarily perfect at all times. But when it messes up, it's eager to do better. David was slow to realise the depth of his sin in the Bathsheba affair. But after hearing Nathan's you are the man speech, he instantly acknowledged that he'd been wrong. And Nathan then instantly told him that God had forgiven him. It was that easy. David's sin still had consequences in the world, uh, the effects of it still hurt, and David had to deal with that. But his guilt before God was wiped away. If David's sin had been against us somehow, for example, if Uriah had been our friend and we knew that the king had done this awful thing and we were angry about it, maybe we would feel a bit like Jonah disgruntled at God's compassion. But this is the remarkable truth of our God. He forgives sins, the little ones, the big ones, and the very big ones that humankind finds really hard to forgive. There's nothing like being on the receiving end of that forgiveness. So how could we look at someone else being forgiven and want to begrudge them that? God is recklessly and wastefully forgiving towards all people who sincerely repent of their sins. Without that repentance, he is just and he will give to sinners as they deserve. But when someone humbles themselves before him, he cheerfully tosses the record of sin and restores the person extravagantly. In all these case studies, repentance and grace were more powerful than sin and even justice. In each case, even one little act of repentance was enough to crush huge sins. We think sin is powerful and unavoidable and dooms us all, but grace is always more powerful and, what's more, easily found. Coming back to that point of legacy and that question of what other people think of us yes we may be misunderstood or misrepresented history may paint us too simply or unkindly using our sins as the headlines this is often especially true after a person has died and can no longer explain themselves and even worse after everyone who knew them has also died and they have no contemporaries left to provide a defence against a bad legacy. But it is different with God. Get your head around this. God is forever 
are contemporary of everyone who has ever lived. No matter how many centuries pass, God remains a first-hand eyewitness of every person who has ever walked the earth. In Matthew 22, Jesus spoke to some Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. And to them, Jesus said these enigmatic but absolutely brilliant words. He said, Long after Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Jesus concludes, so he is the God of the living, not the dead. Now this is remarkable. And I don't know about you, but it, it fills me with hope. God is forever a contemporary of everyone who has ever lived. If you are in the care of God, you will never be forgotten. God lives now, and he also lived when Abraham, Isaac and Jacob lived. That means that God's testimony about them is as fresh now as it was thousands of years ago. I don't believe that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob have a consciousness right now in heaven or what have you. But in the mind of God, they are in a sense still alive. To use a computing analogy, they've been saved to the cloud. You know, a, a person who has died in Christ is not here on earth right now, but they're saved in the mind of God. And when the time comes, he can download them again, fresh and new as they ever were. And Christ will come with the clouds. It's taken the metaphor too far, I know, but you get the point. But this is why... Your legacy with God is the legacy that matters. Not what people think of you. What God says about a person is the only testimony about that person that will truly endure for eternity. Not only that, God never gets our legacy wrong. God knows us thoroughly and completely, better than our most intimate relationships and better than we even know ourselves. He will not misrepresent us. And what's more, when we are repentant, he will gladly give us a new legacy that is without blemish. Now, it's incredible that for all our sins, it is not only possible to reconcile with God, but easy to reconcile with God. He is a God of compassion, he is the father waiting for the prodigal son to return, who sees the repentant son while he's still far off, shuffling home and feeling miserable. And the father goes running down the driveway to give his boy a hug and welcome him home. That's our God. If you want it, if you are repentant and come to God in humility, he will speak well of you forever. Thinking about God's excessive compassion and the fact that God has made it easy to be reconciled with him, we do also need to acknowledge that that ease came with an initial one-off high cost. And that, that's what we're here to do today, to reflect upon in the bread and the wine. God is just as well as compassionate. He is holy as well as merciful. His desire is to show mercy to everyone, but not everyone is repentant. And God does not go back on his word that choosing sin means choosing separation from him. Still to this day, sin unrepented is met ultimately with death. What God did, because he loved the world so much, is open a way to full reconciliation with him. Jesus Christ is that way. And as we sometimes sing, God sent his son into the world knowing he would be given up for men, knowing we would bruise him. But Jesus' death was our birth. Jesus himself willingly became the perfect sacrificial lamb 
And in so doing, he became the linchpin for a brand new system of salvation that turns on its head all our fears about sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yes, but all are able to repent and come to God through Christ. Nobody is excluded. Anybody and everybody can take on the saving name of Jesus Christ. If sin's reach is universal, so also God's grace is universal and more powerful. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough, yes, but likewise, your mustard seed of faith, your tiniest whisper of regret, your genuine repentance before God unleavens the whole batch of dough. If you have sinned, you are not ruined. God can unruin you and make you new again. And the wages of sin is death, yes, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift is more powerful than the wages. It was an expensive gift. It cost the perfect life. But it's a gift nonetheless, and if you ask for it, you will not be denied. So what is a legacy? Well, we're all here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, Psalm 103 says that in the grand sweep of history, we're all like grass that comes up for a while, flowers, and then is blown over and remembered no more. And uh, yeah, it is true. There is no guarantee that we will be remembered well or correctly by other people. Stories do have a way of getting warped as they are retold and embellished. And people have a dreadful tendency of fixating on the bad parts. But God, who knows us intimately while we are alive, will go on knowing us intimately forever, if that's what we want. If we die before the Lord's return, we are nevertheless still alive to God as close to him as we ever were in life. In the end, the legacy that matters is not what other people think of us. The legacy that matters is what God thinks of us. And because God is so compassionate, he is glad to give us an eternal legacy that's all good parts because his grace to us through Christ is so much bigger than any one bad part. As Psalm 103 says, the life of mortals is like grass, they flourish like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Thank you.